And good morning, everyone. We are live. Congratulations. You made it through the week. Good job. And why am I saying good job? Because in the food industry, people who deal with food safety, food quality, all of these things that make sure that our food is safe and wholesome and awesome need to get done. And a lot of times nobody notices, but I notice and Dr. Marshall notices. And so we wanted to say, good job. You did a good job this week. We really appreciate what you did for us. So if you're new to the chat, first off, good morning. Pull up a chair and join us for an hour. We're going to have a nice informal conversation around a food safety topic. And the first thing you'll notice here with this is that it's not a crazy presentation. We're not going to be going through PowerPoints and these type of things. The overall purpose of this is to do what food safety should do, which is to share information and help elevate the standard with everybody. Because food safety is not a point of competition. We're all working in this together. We're all doing the same thing. We all benefit from this. So that's that's our overall purpose here. And one of the things that we love to do on the chat is let us know where in the world you're at. I am in Loveland, Colorado, which is kind of in the northern part of the state, north of Denver. Beautiful area of the country. And Dr. Marshall, where are you at today? It's hard to tell with Doug because he travels all over the place. Well, thanks, Brian. I happen to be 30 miles away from you in my house in beautiful Fort Collins, Colorado. Nice. So, yeah. uh, although we are neighbors, I can't throw a stone and break out one of Brian's windows. <laughs> although I think I've caught him trying one night. So, <laughs> Car is here. Oh, Chile, Wisconsin. It's that time of year. And so if you're on the chat, you'll notice here in our, our chat, part of the fun part of this is the people who participate in the chat also come and watch the chat, which I, I absolutely love. So Cara, so glad you're here. Uh, Stephanie from snowy Germany out in the Munich area out there. Uh, Stephanie, we're putting it together. So Stephanie will be on the chat here coming up next year. Uh, Duncan, <laughs> Duncan exists in the cloud. And so that's a, a definite fact uh, for sure. Uh, what's really cool about the chat too, is as people are coming in, you'll see people from all over the world. So India and Nigeria and other places, it's just, Absolutely fantastic. So we really appreciate your support in those areas. So before we dive into our topic, one of the things that we like to do on the chat as well is everybody, please pick up your beverage of choice and join Doug and I for a sip. And I always assume that everybody already knows who you are, Doug, but I listen, a brief introduction. So Dr. Douglas Marshall is the Chief Scientific Officer at Eurofin Scientific North America. And if you want to know something about Micro, that, that's the guy right there. He's one of the leading authorities on microbiology in manufacturing, right? So if you're trying to solve a problem and you can't get it figured out, Doug probably can help you out. So uh, thanks for all you do in that area, Doug. I appreciate it, Brian. Cool. So with that, gosh, we got a whole bunch of, I think it's kind of a natural thing this time of year to look back. And we did, we did a chat here a couple of weeks ago on putting together objectives for 2024 and these type of things. So kind of this reflective mode is a natural type thing. So part of that is looking back and saying to ourselves, you know, what were we doing at this time last year? So um, Doug, do you kind of have any idea what you were up to at this time last year? Yeah, well, in December of 2022, uh -huh. I was invited to give a presentation at a food safety workshop for uh, South Pacific Islanders on the island of Guam. Mm -hmm. And this was a U.S. government funded project. And the organizer invited me to go. And I said, oh, wow, what a wonderful opportunity. Would, would be happy to. What topic do you want me to address? And the organizer said, well, you know, you're an international company. You do all this high tech stuff. Why don't you just talk about anything you want to talk about? And I said, oh, well, this is the greatest invite ever because mm -hmm. you know, I can bullshit for uh, hours on end if you want me to. So I was thinking... So they're going to be hit for, this was a four-day workshop. They're going to be hit with FISMA, with HACCP, with, um, you know, risk assessments, all that kind of stuff. Why don't I give them uh, kind of a future look about how we are managing food safety today and, and how we will be doing it tomorrow? 
So I prepared this talk on the use of molecular methods for pathogen ID, for pathogen detection, for strain differentiation. And I also used the example of uh, where I spun up the third test for COVID in the marketplace in the middle of COVID trying to save, save the world from this dreaded mm -hmm. infectious uh, pandemic uh, virus. So that, that was the talk that I put together. And I didn't know much about the audience. So I get, get to the presentation venue, which was at the University of Guam. And the room was full of extension agents from all US South Pacific territories. And so these extension agents, they're funded by your tax dollars to help out the citizens of these you know, Pacific Island atolls that are US territories. And their job was to be the expert on, on food uh, for their respective islands. And um, so I gave my presentation and it was just the most irrelevant presentation I could have ever imagined for that audience. It, I mean, it was way up here. And most of these people, if you think about uh, their existence, it's, it's, it's a poverty existence. So these islands, you can't grow food because you're on a coral atoll that's just basically sand. So it's highly depleted in, in nitrogen, for example. So you have uh, whatever fresh food you can get, you might have a small garden plot. Um, you probably have an abundance of seafood, so that, that's good. But you are solely dependent on that boat that comes once a month with the mm -hmm. shelf-stable prepared packaged foods. Now, these boats will also carry fresh produce, but it takes them uh, at least a couple of weeks to transit the ocean to get mm -hmm. to that island. So that produce is usually highly deteriorated when it's presented to the um, population. So even fresh produce is difficult to come by. And I was talking to these county extension agents and I said, <clears throat> what, what's life like on your island? Teach me. So here I am, a privileged old white guy living in the States <laughs> who spends his day dreaming about the use of technology to help solve food safety issues. And uh, on an island, you, you, have, you may or you may not have electricity. If you have a refrigerator, you probably only run it um, for six hours a day because mm -hmm. you can't afford to pay the electric bill. Um, you have um, uh, water, some of, of which it may be running water. Some of it may be just whatever is brought in. Because again, uh, you know, if you have well water, the island has to be big enough to be able to not have salt water intrusion into that freshwater aquifer. Yeah. So just getting people to wash their hands, getting people to uh, practice the two hour or four hour rule when you prepare food for consumption, not to leave it unrefrigerated or in this case, unconsumed. Your animal protein beyond fish, you might be lucky to have some family that has a few pigs. And so when you have a big family gathering, you might slaughter a pig and everybody, um, you know, brings a potluck dish. Think of this, you're under the palm trees. I mean, it sounds like an idyllic situation, but uh, the opportunities for temperature abuse are, are extreme. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's what I was doing in December of 2022. So uh, giving my usual ooh, high tech, this is how we solve the world's problems to an audience that it was irrelevant for. <laughs> yeah, I can just see uh, somebody in the audience going, what? Um, uh, how do I keep flies off of my food, Dr. Marshall? Yeah. <laughs> Have, have you seen um, some of those videos on YouTube of street vendors in India, right? And they they're scooping up there, and then, you know the they're you know somebody's trying to do this, but it's just an obviously a losing battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so the course of this year, hearing conversations about how dysfunctional FDA is, how we continue to have recalls and outbreaks, and you know you park that into your everyday concept of what life is like, and then you compare that to what I was looking at um on the island of guam with with this audience so couldn't be further further apart yeah well and, and i think too it's a good lesson for us here to remember as well because a lot of times when companies get 483s or warning letters or things of this nature doug 
it's almost every single time the basics are cited in those as well, right? So um, investigator observed multiple employees not washing their hands properly, uh, using gloves to pick product up off the floor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a lot of times the assumption that the basics are being taken care of is, is not there. Um, <laughs> yeah, speaking of standards too as well, you know, so for a long time, you know, with SQFs, I was on the Technical Advisory Council and we would get this question quite a bit is why in the world does it say in your standard that um, paint, if, if equipment is painted, it needs to be of a particular type of paint, right? We can't do that in the US. Well, no, you can't. Now to your example, um, imagine some piece of equipment out in the middle of nowhere in a room that's not even, you know, doesn't even have four walls and they're painting it just to keep the rust off of it, right? Because it's not even metal that's non-corrosive. What, they're going to have stainless steel? No. Right there, they're trying to put this together the best they can. Yeah, and um, you know, while I was there, I got a chance to visit the island of Guam and hang out at the university there. And mm -hmm. uh, some of the technological innovations that were being explored were really um, uh, examples of human ingenuity. Uh -huh. So, just to build a raised bed garden that you can actually have soil supplements and have protection from excess sun and rain. You mm -hmm. know, just, just the, the, the miracle of engineering PVC pipe and, and a tarp uh, to be able to get food grown for a, a remote island was, uh, was really interesting to see. Yeah, we, we tend to think in the US as, you know, tropical islands as these lush paradises, but in a lot of ways in reality, they're, they're little oases in the middle of a gigantic desert from the standpoint of being able to properly produce things. Yeah, yeah, just the poverty level is uh, is extreme and people here in the States, we, we just don't have that exposure to that right. part of the world. And, and, and people so, forget that these are US territories. So um, we are responsible for their well-being. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the deal. And yeah, that's a, a good segue then into our conversation here for today, right? Which as as you're kind of listing off these type of things right it's like okay food that's sitting out all day right so you can picture the family gathering with with the barbecue pig in the pit and all these type of things and then all the side dishes that are sitting out and pathogens growing all day long in this high heat and humidity just just waiting to infect somebody that's not a pleasant scenario that's for sure um and so with that as well you know it's we really can't throw stones either because a lot of it, and this kind of gets to our topic here for today, is we keep kind of seeing the same things over and over again. And these things keep coming back. And so we pulled out some particular issues when we were prepping for our call here today to talk about. And so some of the current issues that are definitely catching my attention. And uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, Frank Giannis is quite active on, on Twitter now, which is good. And he's been commenting on, on some of these topics quite a bit as well. And the first one that caught my eye is, is a repeat. And so, of course, here in Colorado, we're, like, we're very sensitive to this with Jensen Farms, is uh, cantaloupe. Oh, all right. We've got more issues with cantaloupe. Yeah. So I feel sorry if, if, if you're in the business of growing or processing cantaloupe because um, – we continue to have salmonellosis and listeriosis outbreaks associated with that particular product. And it's pretty well known what the, the, the fruit issues are. So you've got a absorbent rind that mm -hmm. is difficult, if not impossible to clean, let alone sanitize. Um, you have a edible pulp that is high pH. So unlike most fruits, um, you don't have pH as your friend in the edible tissue of the cantaloupe. Mm. And so uh, I think one of the contributing factors, obviously, are agricultural practices. So I've been in uh, growing areas working with uh, farmers and packing houses of cantaloupes over the last 10 years. And it's kind of the recurring themes that I see are um, uh, there is an interest in growing organic. And so mm -hmm. I literally have seen 30 foot piles of turkey litter sitting on a vacant lot that is used to amend the soil. 
mm -hmm. prior to a growing season. So you can tell me what kind of pathogens are in turkey litter. It's not um, uh, properly uh, ensiled, meaning it, it has not been fermented to get up at a pasteurization temperature or at a inhibitory pH. So it's just broadcast on the field and the seeds are planted. And so you get a constant pathogen inoculation in those growing environments. Um, most of these, well, in fact, all the fields are flat. So anytime mm -hmm. you have excessive rain and you have flood events, uh, I've been in examples where there was a um, Wagyu ranch, Wagyu beef ranch uphill from a cantaloupe uh, plot. Ooh. And when it rains, all of that uh, cattle refuse flows right directly onto the cantaloupe crop. Um, some of these areas have very shallow aquifers. And so when you drill an irrigation well, um, I was at a facility where um, the aquifer level was about four feet under the ground and uh, the wellhead was uncapped mm. and so again if you get a flood event where's that water going it's going mm -hmm. right into the aquifer or you run off on the field goes right into the aquifer and so the pathogen load in some of these fields was just I mean you could pull samples and you would be lucky not to find salmonella for example yeah all right so so you've got good agricultural practice problems and then when the melons are harvested you're probably better off just dry packing the melons um, rather than bring them back to a packing shed where you go through a wash cycle so the jensen brothers uh scenario was they uh, decided they wanted to wash their melons thinking that that was a good food safety intervention and it actually uh, exacerbated the problem because you're rough handling the melons. Some are going to break. They're going to re release all their high nutrient juices. You're going to contaminate the outside of the rinds. You may or may not be using an antimicrobial in your wash water. You're probably doing it in an open packing shed. I was in a, uh, a facility where the drip line of the packing shed was dripping right onto the conveyor belts and right into the wash tub. Ooh. And there were birds everywhere. So every time it rained, all of that uh, salmonella load was going right into the processing system. Hmm. Then you wet pack the melons. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so now you've got a great environment for listeria to grow. So yeah. you cool them down. They're wet. They've got uh, cantaloupe juice all over the outside. You can multiply and grow. And then, Brian, as you said, I travel a lot. And so every Hampton Inn, every hotel breakfast buffet, they usually have one fruit that's chopped up, ready to go, and that's cantaloupe. Yep. Um, how long it sat on that buffet, who knows? If I go to the grocery store and I want to buy fresh cut, ready to eat fruit, usually I buy a plastic, you can find a plastic cup full of cantaloupe. How much temperature abuse does that happen, either uh, during transportation, during retail display, at somebody's house? So, you know, every single one of these risk points can contribute to um, whether or not we have an outbreak scenario or not. Right. And, and those pre-cut pieces of fruit that are very convenient uh are a great way right when they're preparing that food any any pathogens are sitting on the outside of that rind and then they run that knife through there and they're contaminating all those surfaces it's kind of the same as why is hamburger more risky than a steak well it's because you're mixing it all up and putting the pathogens everywhere within that product you just multiply that surface ratio immensely with that product uh, it's kind of like uh, duncan is saying here right is uh it's like people washing their raw chicken in the sink right and, and on YouTube, there's, you know, complete videos where people critique chefs and all the mistakes that chef makes between, you know, raw area and cooked area and how they're cross-contaminating things within all of those. And you just go, ew. <laughs> yeah, but remember those guys and gals, they're entertainers. They're not professional food safety experts like our audience today. Right, exactly. Um so uh Gigi, which is very very good to see her. Nice to see you. 
uh, had a comment in here. Let's see, trying to write a message in the chat, but it's not working. So she was a food inspector in Brazil. And it was a, yeah, so she's pretty much saying here that, yeah, it's a, <laughs> she's backing up what you're saying here. <laughs> I, uh, in a previous company, we were looking at a supplier in the Philippines and he had, you know, sent over the food safety plan for us to review and all these type of things. And I took a look at it and I'm like, okay, well, I've got some questions. And so we, we got this owner on the phone and started talking with him and peppering him with food safety questions. And after a while he stopped us and said, Hey, Hey, listen, Brian, I, I, I got to be honest with you here. Um, we want to sell product in the U S so we went and hired a student at the local university who, who wrote this document for us so that we could give it to you. I don't, I'm not really that familiar with what it says. Um, yeah, right. You have to double check this stuff. Um, we see a bunch of issues going on right now. We'll talk a little bit more about this later with uh, uh, lead in, in, you know, applesauce for, for children in these different packs and kind of the leading theory at this point in time is cinnamon as the source. And um uh, Go ahead and look at the FDA guidance relative to cinnamon and potential pathogens in cinnamon, right? So cinnamon, you're, you're taking the bark off of a tree, right? It's exposed to everything, and they're essentially just processing it. No control. Um, I have talked with suppliers, and you need to understand that as well. How are they processing this, and what are they doing for those risks as well? But um uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here on that. So I, it's just uh, kind of the same type of things, how these all link together. So cantaloupe is definitely a big one. Another new one that's kind of a, um, makes sense, but we haven't really seen a whole lot on this is listeria. So there's a big issue going on right now with peaches, nectarines, and plums. Any, any thoughts around that, Doug? Well, um, some of the reports that I've been seeing on these kinds of tree fruits are Number one, um, if you test them, it is reasonably foreseeable that you could occasionally find salmonella on mm -hmm. a on a piece of fruit, or excuse me, on a whole fruit, uh, both in the orchard as well as after harvest. Uh, so that that in and of itself isn't shouldn't be surprising for most people because when you have a fruit orchard, you're going to have um, animal intrusion. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be birds that are nesting in the trees. Um, you're going to have drops that are uh, a good food source for um, feral animals that are roaming through the orchard looking for, for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So you will have a relatively low level shedding of salmonella in that um, growing environment. Um, most of these uh, products are, are dry packed, so they're picked. They're put in a box and they're going to retail. That uh -huh. might actually be a better practice than, than harvesting the fruit and then doing wet washing, mm -hmm. uh, particularly because we know that these wet, wet wash systems um, are highly prone to um, having insanitary conditions in the, in the packing house yeah. uh, because they're large. You've got large flume streams of water. You might have antimicrobial in the water to keep the microbial loads down in the water. Do they have much efficacy on the fruit? Some, but not a lot. Right. Uh, and then you've added water to the system. And so when you've got food on the outside of the, of the peach, for example, whether the fuzz is important or not, I, I think that's kind of a minor consideration. Mm. Um, then, then you've got water, you've got food, you might have the right temperature. I mean, that's uh, the equation for pathogen survival and growth. Right. Well, and, and part of that too, right, is remember a few years ago, um, Halloween, there was some issues with caramel apples. And, and people were like, oh my goodness, how did that happen? And they found out that, oh, hey, look at that. Pathogens are getting down inside of that apple through the stem and these type of things. So uh, and part of it as well is, did the pat was the pathogen present before the fruit was even formed? Right, so you have the flower, and then the fruit starts growing around that pathogen and provides a nice little environment for it. So that's kind of nice. Um, part of it as well with a lot of harvesting practices with with agriculture. You see these videos on YouTube where uh, they'll have a machine that'll come up and clamp a tree, and then shake the whole tree, and then the fruit falls on the ground. 
And we know that the ground is a major source of these pathogens as well. And then so they go and they pick the fruit up off the ground and off they go. So some of the fruit came off the tree. Some of the fruit was already on the ground, to your point earlier. And then it goes into the process as well. Yeah. And we spent a lot of time um, talking about sanitation in a food processing facility. How do you sanitize uh, a lettuce harvesting mower or a fruit picking robot? Yeah. Well, what, and, and what are the best practices for that? Are they built to proper sanitary design? No. Right. And where and does this outside all day? And yeah. All night. And, yeah. And, and during, season. during the off season, this stuff is sitting in a shed somewhere and then they bring it out and they dust it off and they use it. Mm -hmm. And it may be a piece of equipment that's shared. That's an expensive piece of equipment that's shared with multiple farms. So then it's traveling between farms as well. And harvesting crates, they sit outside when they're not in use. Oh, yes. And they get reused over and over again. Um, anybody who's in the, been in the Valley in California when it's tomato harvesting time, right? Those are trucks going down the road with all the giant totes, the big plastic totes full of tomatoes going out to the processor. Um, part, part of what we're seeing out there as well, too, and this has been something that uh, I've been tracking very closely, uh, is emerging pathogens. So Bacillus cereus really seems to have got a lot of attention this year. What, what are your thoughts around that, Doug? Well, I, I think uh, it has been a pathogen that uh, <clears throat> for the history of myself as a food microbiologist has been gleefully ignored mm. uh, simply because it's a spore former. We know it's there. Uh, we know from historical outbreaks it's been associated with uh, starchy foods that have been cooked. So the spores survive the cooking process. You get temperature abuse after cooking. Spores germinate and grow in things like rice and pasta and potatoes. Um, and so you've got this gross temperature abuse window that allows for the surviving spores to multiply uh, if they are toxin forming strains and they can produce toxin in the product. The product is then served without subsequent reheating um, to a kill step. And, and so that, that has always been kind of the, the, the cycle of Bacillus cereus. Um, right. But I think more and more people now are, are, for whatever reason, are starting to look for it. And, oh, my gosh, they're finding it. And the problem they're having is, what is the risk? Yeah. So just because it's there... Um, does that necessarily mean that it is a food safety risk? Mm -hmm. And I think a yeah. lot of folks are struggling to get an answer to that question. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it Bacillus cereus is a weird one when you compare it to salmonella or listeria or something like this, in that, you know, if FDA, you know, finds us in your product, easy call. Oh, oh, there's a listeria present in your finished product. Your product is adulterated and a threat to that consumer. Recall. Not true with Bacillus cereus, right? You can have the bacteria present, you can have the spores present, and it's still not a food safety risk. Uh, to your point, it can become a risk. Um, we all remember the stories of the church picnic where they make the potato salad and it sits out for too long and toxin gets produced. It's And that's kind of the wrinkle in the whole thing with Bacillus cereus is it's the toxin, right? It's like coagulase positive staph. It's the toxin that's produced. And... Some of the toxins that, that Bacillus cereus produces are heat stable. And this is what I think is getting a lot of people. And you have entire new categories of products that are popping up. And we've seen this in plant-based products, beverages, where they've had recalls associated with Bacillus cereus for this reason. Um, so you'll have a pre-processing process where you are making some base or doing different things with these plant-based products, which have natural spores that are present in these uh they say oh cool right and they they start growing they get to high enough numbers they may produce a toxin you then go through pasteurization the cells are killed the spores survive maybe and if you have heat toxin it's heading right on through that process and that could make people sick and so you need to understand that as you're building out. And I, I think within this particular space, and you're seeing, I saw on LinkedIn, Doug, there was a paper that was published in Europe and uh, on Bacillus cereus and these type of activities in plant-based products and what you're seeing with, you know, 
pea and oat and fava and uh, lentils or you know, all of it. You're, they're pretty much trying with anything that they can for these plant-based products. And there's definitely uh, risks in there that weren't necessarily anticipated when the products were being first manufactured. Yeah, and the other thing, just from a microbiologist's perspective, the, the challenge that the laboratories are going to have is uh, differentiating Bacillus cereus from other very closely uh, genetically related bacilli. Yeah. And the classic one we've struggled with for many, many years is Bacillus thuringiensis, mm. which is a natural bio uh, pesticide mm. that is applied in many farming applications oh, as, yeah. as an insecticide. And so you could be dosing a crop with BT toxin. Um, and uh, if you still have live viable Bacillus thuringiensis, it might show up as a uh, positive test for Bacillus cereus. Interesting. I know that um, there's been quite a bit of work done in that area with some chrom chromogenic media in Europe that's just now coming over, which which helps to then you know split those apart. But uh, if you're if you're working with a laboratory who doesn't know that, then you could be getting some false positives. So it's always very important when you're setting up these type of microbiological tests, especially when you're starting to push the envelope in these areas that you're working with a partner like your offense that understands these type of things and can help guide you to get the, the proper test. Uh, super important because um, microbiology, as we all know in food manufacturing is very different than a lot of different things that operations is used to, right? So um, they're looking for numbers that are consistent. And if you look at the chemistry side of things, you know, pH and total solids and these type of things in products, you know, pretty consistent micro, not the case <laughs> it's it's spotty it may be in some areas it may shed there may be a biofilm the bacteria may choose not to grow during your test and as as we all know with with spore testing that initial heat shock process of how you're actually preparing your sample critical right to getting those right results so you can have the exact same sample prepare it different ways and get completely different results so you have to be really careful with that Yep, understood. So, I mean, so with Bacillus cereus, you know, so we, we've seen some big recalls. Uh, so China has been seeing tons of issues with Bacillus cereus. So we've been seeing rice noodles, uh, chili powder. We've seen some issues with spices on that side as well. And we talked about plant-based milks. So um, definitely, if you have a potential risk in that area, go back and look at your food safety plan and say, hey, did, did, we, did we actually look at BC in our products? And FDA BAM, the Bacteriological Analytical Manual, is a great place to start. Start looking at those type of things. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the micro side of things. Another one, uh, foreign material. Again, right? We talk about food, you know, foreign material and products quite a bit here on the chat because I think it gets ignored. Um, but what are you kind of seeing out there in this past year relative to foreign material? Well, um, we. I'll, I'll just give you some anecdotal information. We saw quite an uptick in um, uh, foreign material related to glove use um, mm. when COVID first started, and um, so we had a lot of uh, a lot of work to try and identify um, the, that plastic material that was showing up in the products. And so we just had a proliferation of people now starting to use gloves associated with COVID. So, mm. um, and if you remember when you go to the target of the Walmart parking lot, what was littered on the floor of the parking lot? Yeah. You had yeah. masks. Mm. Uh, and so we've had a similar thing, thing with masks, but, um, foreign material, uh, from a food safety perspective, it's, it's usually not a significant contributor to public health. Um, mm -hmm. you could have a one-off or a two-off. Certainly you're going to get, uh, customer complaints when they can find a visual foreign object. But one thing, uh, we have seen an uptick on, um, is, um, economic fraud. Uh, yes. So, uh, remember, uh, the other thing that COVID gave us was supply chain issues. And, um, so there was a lot of, uh, economic adulteration in the ingredient marketplace, for, particularly for high value ingredients where you had a limited supply. Right. And, um, 
most people didn't care during the COVID area because they were just so desperate to get these ingredients so they could continue manufacturing whatever it was they were manufacturing. But now we're starting to see uh, some of these legacy issues with that practice. And so people now are starting to look. And sometimes the motivation for looking is because you've got an ingredient that you're using for its functional properties and it's failing in that use. And the question is why? Yeah. Um, and so usually it's because the product uh, has been adulterated with something else that diminishes the performance of that ingredient. And um, just some of the examples that we've seen here very recently would be things where um, uh, usually we're talking about powdered ingredients, things that just visually you look and you go, oh, it's a white powder, okay? Mm -hmm. It must be okay. Well, what can you substitute with? I mean, use your imagination and it's not hard to find things you can substitute. You yeah. use it in your product and let's say it's an acidulant and you're using it to achieve a desired pH because that is your preventive control. And if it's been diluted with something else that's not an acid, now when you're using it, using your formula recipe, and then you go verify pH and the pH is too high, you know, the question is what went wrong? Was it a math error in the formulation? Was it a weighing error at the at the batch prep step, or was it an ingredient uh, issue that you inherited from a supply chain? Yeah. So, so that's just an example where economic fraud could lead to an out of control uh, food safety situation. Right. So, uh, quite frankly, most of us who live in the developed world, we tend to trust our suppliers. And if I'm a uh, nefarious um, uh, supplier, uh, boy, I sure would like to have that as my field of opportunity where people don't think about it, they're not looking, and they don't care. Right. So as a fraudster, that, that is the best possible scenario under which you can work. Mm -hmm. So if you're a food manufacturer and that is your posture, why wouldn't I want to uh, dilute my product 5%, 10%, 20%? How much can I get away with before I get caught? Right. And um, you may even, so yeah, let's say that you, you have some type of an oil in your process, sunflower oil or something like this. And oh, Ukraine's at war and that's the leading manufacturer of sunflower oil in the in the world and you can't get it, right? So your procurement people are scrambling, trying to find sunflower oil. And you may actually find real sunflower oil and you check it and everything else, but you forget that it's old. So the oil is now rancid and it's got a high content of these off radical flavors and things like that. And you think you're getting good products. And now again, you've still got a problem. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. Part of this, and, and we've talked about this on the food fraud side of things on the chat as well, is hey, I want to buy from you. You're a new supplier. Send me a sample of your product, right? There's no guarantee that that sample you're getting in the mail is the same stuff that's going to show up at your plant. Uh, they may have a nice pretty bag of material sitting in their office that they use for samples and the stuff that actually arrives in the 40-foot container at your plant, not even close to the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the other thing that we're seeing, um, particularly this year, is uh, food that's manufactured for a high-risk consumer mm. seems to be showing up in the press a lot here lately. And, and the high-risk consumer, in this case, is infants and children. Yeah. So we've had a bunch of 483s issued to the infant formula uh, industries uh, due to the presence of Coronabacter. Yeah. And uh, this is not new information for a formula manufacturer. We, we have known about the risk of Coronabacter as an environmental contaminant. Um, but we have had these uh, outbreaks that have been associated with infant formula manufacturers. And so uh, when FDA has scrutinized those manufacturing sites, they have discovered a lot of opportunities for improvement. And uh, it's just really astonishing for me that, that that was the current state of that industry. Yeah. You know, how could they have been so lax in their food safety programs 
um, to, to now become under the radar screen. And the end result was we had a severe shortage of formula because all of these companies were uh, recalling product and having to shut down facilities to remediate facilities. Yeah. So, you know, how many years has this been brewing? This couldn't have just happened this year for some, you know, act of God. This is something that's been brewing for a while and the industry got um, either um, woefully ignorantly sleepy mm-hmm. or intentionally deciding that this was a problem they didn't need to focus on right? or somewhere well, in between. And I think that's a really good point, Doug, because... Yeah, this just didn't pop up overnight. There have been high-profile infant formula recalls in the recent past. There was a huge one in Europe with Lactalis a few years ago with infant formula. So the warning signs are there. So I, I think part of this, right, is is as consumers and as manufacturers who are responsible for food safety, you need to look at these things and say, huh, all right, is, is there something that we're missing here and something that we need to be worried about that we weren't really thinking about before, right? Think back to our Bacillus Serious conversation a little bit ago. Part of what you need to be doing in food safety, and that's kind of our theme for our talk here today, is you're just not responsible for things that are happening now. You're responsible for things that could be happening in the future, right? And that's, that's not an easy thing to do, right? You're, you're trying to track variables and likelihood and keeping up on things. Frankly, that's hopefully why you're here today is to help keep up on these type of things and talk with Doug and ask questions and see if there's things that you need to be worried about. Um, the other the other side of this as well too, and and I think the infant formula is a, a good you know thing on this as well, is tons of pressure right now on food manufacturing across the entire industry. We all have gone to the grocery store and look at our bill and go, oh, oh yikes, right? Um, that puts incredible pressure. My, my wife, uh, the other week, uh, had bought some new shampoo. She ran out of shampoo, went to the store, got a new bottle of shampoo, still had the old bottle compared it to the new bottle, right? You know where this is going. Hey, this thing's, you know, hell, this is 200 mils smaller than the old one, right? And they try and make it look the same, right? They're trying to figure out ways to keep that price point consistent. And that tends to really cheese consumers off when they see that. So now in the plant, And if you're responsible for food safety, there's going to be a ton of pressure if you're not already feeling it relative to the operational budget for that plant. So is the plant manager looking at that budget and going, oh, oh my goodness, right? Okay, Uh, maintenance guy, we need to make sure that we're stretching things out as long as we can. Sanitation guys, we need to make sure that we're using the absolute minimum amount of sanitary chemicals that we need to be using to make this run. Uh, operations guys, we need to make sure that we're not overstaffing labor. I just need the bare minimum of people to keep this line going, trying to keep things going and and keep that plant in, in the black. And those things add up because one of the things that happens in food safety, and you see this is the times that we are most dependent upon our food supply. So holidays, the Super Bowl, things of this nature, when our production really ramps up, that's when we have the highest risk. And that's when we need to be most vigilant because of those type of factors. So you need to be, if you're working in food safety, hyper vigilant during these type of situations to make sure that those type of activities are taking place in a way that we need to have them happen. Yeah, there's always this push and pull. So you've got company shareholders asking company management, we need to increase our profit margins. Then you have operations, which includes your food quality and food safety personnel mm-hmm. that uh, need capital to make sure their products are safe. Yep. And so, you know, to get capital, you're eating into your profit margin. So it is uh, uh, a, a constant dance that companies, every individual company has exactly the same issues. And so what food safety people have to be able to do is to make arguments on capital improvements and the way you do that at least i counsel folks is make your argument based on dollar signs not Mm -hmm. based on an inspection report but if we don't replace this piece of equipment or if we don't upgrade our floor or if we don't uh, extend our sanitation time this is what it's going to cost us in terms of um, increased risk for outbreaks or recall. Right. 
And for outbreaks, it's kind of hard to put a dollar value on it. You could go in the literature and look at the numbers. Sometimes the numbers are frighteningly large uh, to the point where it could be an existential, existential problem for the company. You can go out of business. Right. Uh, with recalls, it's a little bit easier. So here's our average production lot size. If we screw up, it's going to cost us this amount to recall that lot. Right. So, so you know, you, you need to be working with your CFO to get these numbers and working with your production manager to think about, okay, you're trying to lean out your operations because that decreases your costs, increases your profit margins. But at some point you get to a, a situation where you can't get any leaner and still make mm -hmm. safe products. Right. And on that front, well, number one, right, doing things like this and staying plugged into what's going on in the industry, super important because we're all fighting against this phrase that I absolutely hate, which is, well, Brian, I don't understand why you're so worried. We've never had a problem before, right? So, okay, well, past luck equals future performance. Well, great. We, you know, we've, we've, you know, we played roulette, Russian roulette, and we've been lucky so far. That doesn't mean that's going to continue. So going back to our example, like infant formula and things like this, you may be working at an infant formula company that hasn't had a recall, but it doesn't take a genius to go out there and look around and say, okay, well, CFO, we haven't had an issue yet, but this company has, and this company has, and this company has. FDA is going to be coming to look at us, <laughs> and we can estimate how much it costs these other companies when they had this grief. Tell you what, let's prevent that from happening. Right? And it, sometimes analogy in these, in these areas in your personal life can help as well. Um, you know, we you need to maintain your car. <laughs> you need to go in for regular oil changes and make sure your tire's in good condition and keep your windshield wiper fluid. Yeah, Brush your teeth. <laughs> your personal hygiene. Right? Yeah, you may be able to put it off for a little while and <laughs> stick with the teeth one, right? And, you know, my teeth are fine. I don't really need to brush them that much. Well... All of a sudden, six months later, you're sitting in the dentist's office and he's drilling away in your mouth, right? And you're regretting that decision, right? So, and that's, I think that's part of the challenge of what we do, Doug, is if we're successful, right? We talked about this in the beginning, the damage doesn't happen, right? Yeah. Here's another trend that I think uh, also contributes to this problem is um, many food businesses are now being purchased and owned by venture capitalists. Who investors. And so these are um, companies that buy up brands. They are uh, most of the time they don't have anybody on staff that has any experience running a food manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. And many of these companies that are sold have a lot of deferred maintenance in the physical plant. And right. I mean a lot. Right. And so that might not be represented in the due diligence done by the acquirer. Yeah. So they see this large piece of equipment. Hey, it trans um, um, transitions ingredient A into ingredient B. So you know whatever that that unit operation is. And some of these legacy pieces of equipment can be dozens. Um, of years old and um, they have probably been band-aided to death to get to uh, the current operational state but it could clunk at any minute yeah um, and so do you keep putting super glue and band-aids on to keep that um, system running it was probably built uh, to insanitary um, specifications meaning you can't really get them clean and you can't get them sanitary. Right. Um, and then you go to the new owners and say, Hey, we need, you know, uh, $2 million to upgrade the facility. How quickly is that conversation shut down? Yeah, exactly. Because two, two points on that. And it's a really good thing for us to all think about is number one, a lot of times in food companies, the senior leadership, is not from food, right? They, they didn't come up through the plants. They didn't, it's a, it's a CFO from a automaker or something like this, who now all of a sudden is the CEO of a food company. And to your point, when acquisitions happen, it's financial. And so the accountants come in to the company they're thinking about buying and they don't want to advertise this. So they're keeping it low key that they're thinking about buying this company because they want to avoid a bidding war with potentially another purchaser of this company. 
And they go into these special rooms that are set up, which have all the financials on the target company. And it's to the it's to the company's advantage that's looking at being acquired to make those books look as good as possible. So to your point, that $2 million CapEx for that new piece of machinery that's needed, that's, that's not going to happen, right? And all they're looking at is that EBITDA, right? The earnings before income tax, amortization, and depreciation. And they're saying, okay, well, what's, what's your sales? What's your profit margin? What'd you pay in taxes? Okay, yeah, this is looking pretty good based upon all this and the multiple. And the financial guys all kick out a number and then they decide that that's the right purchase price. Uh, to your point, then after the fact, all these little gremlins start popping up. Wouldn't it be a good idea to send someone in who knows about these type of things prior to the acquisition and say, oh, we've been to your plant. Uh, you have significant capital that needs to occur. We're going to deduct the cost of that capital from our purchase price. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of times that doesn't happen. It's a critical move in companies to be able to do that. Um, because you know, as food safety professionals, a lot of times we're the ones caught with trying to fix those problems after the fact. And on that side too, I've been involved with this as well, is companies may acquire other companies. Let's say that you're a dairy company and all of a sudden you acquire a juice company uh, because the CEO thinks it'd be a really great idea because, hey, there are beverages. What's the difference? Huge, <laughs> huge difference. I may not be qualified as a dairy food safety professional to completely understand what's even needed for food safety in the juice industry. And I've got to catch up really fast to understand those activities. And during that period of time, there's a risk and there's a huge gap associated with that because a lot of times during these purchases, the pre previous leadership and teams, right? They're like, okay, well, we don't need you guys anymore, right? We already have a VP of food safety. We don't need to. So um, sorry, but you need to find a new job, right? And that knowledge gets lost. Mm -hmm. So trends, what um, in our last five minutes or so here, I mean, tons of things going around out here. So um, kind of a dealer's choice here, Doug, whole genome sequencing, all these other types of things out there that are happening. Um, what, what's catching your attention out there? Um, I guess from a personal perspective, the thing that irritates me the most I mean, there are a lot of things in life that irritate me, but this is one that I think uh, from a, a food safety perspective is just baffling to me how poorly the industry uh, manages this problem. And that is um, um, improperly labeled products for allergens. Uh. Uh, you know, leading cause of recalls every week goes by and there is a, uh, an undeclared allergen issue on uh, with a food product. And um, although it's not an issue where we're going to have mass casualty events, it is a recurring issue for the industry. It's a recurring industry for uh, regulatory bodies. And uh, it just, I'm just baffled at how poorly the industry is managing this and has been managing this for years. So when I think about the future, um, what I would like to see is companies um, being better able to manage this problem. And um, it, it's not really that difficult. You know, we don't need sophisticated science to help us manage allergen declaration on labels. Uh. Um, you know, it, it's you know, an ingredient management problem, it's an R&D problem, it's an ingredient sourcing problem, and it's a problem out on the manufacturing floor, but people all are making a judgment call at every one of these steps. So it's a people problem for me. So um, I would very much like to see the food industry um, solve this problem. It's, it's a management problem so we spend I, I mean i spend almost every waking moment dealing with pathogens but from a personal perspective it annoys the hell out of me because i've got family members who have food intolerances to 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 be playing russian roulette every time i go to a restaurant or every time i go to a grocery store i'm looking at menu items and ingredients i am a hundred percent reliant on that declaration for the safety and well-being of my family. Yeah. 
And when I have so little faith that the food industry, quite frankly, I'm going to use some French here, gives a shit about this, it continues to be a problem for my family. Yeah. And, and when you think about the consequences of a household, if you have just one individual who has one food allergy, the orbit of that individual also now has to change their behavior. Right. So it's not just that one individual who has uh, a sensitivity. It now becomes the problem of the whole family. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so um, it, it's, it's not a happy situation for me. Yep, absolutely. And I, I think you're absolutely right because for the, for the labeling piece of it, it kind of breaks down into two buckets. There's the new products that are coming down the pike and then there's changes to existing products. So a lot of times, right, the R and D guys, they're doing bench tops and they're changing stuff and tweaking that. And a lot of times the labeling doesn't follow suit or there's a change in the manufacturing plant where the printer of the package, it changes from one company to another because they're a lower cost. And you have a change in that that may not be checked off on. Or you have old packaging material that's sitting in the warehouse. And oops, we forgot to order packaging last week. Hey, there's a roll of film back in the warehouse back there. Go back there and grab that. And it, it, if you start asking those questions, and, and a lot of times with food safety professionals, it just comes back to this question of, hey, this um, new label that we're putting in the plant, who checked that? Right. And a lot of times you'll get this. Nope. Nobody's checking it. Or, and I, we've seen this time and time again, and this is a major, this one irritates me. I won't name a company, but major snack food company. And they've had over the past few years, multiple recalls for allergen mislabeling. Those are all to your point, Doug, system failures. And when those occur as someone like yourself, who is very, very concerned with these type of issues, because it, this all comes down to people, everything we're doing comes down to protecting people. And if you don't have that level of trust, it's gone, right? What, once that company has shown that they're incapable of managing this correctly, you're not going to buy from them again. Um, the, the radical analogy I use, because it's very obvious for us as Americans, is going to foreign countries on vacation with a less than stellar reputation. Boy, our guardrails go up big time and we're very, very careful. We don't want to get in that situation. And I'm sure no one on the chat wants to get in that situation. So I, I agree. That's, that's one that irritates me and as well, because that's always in the top three and it's completely preventable. And, and, and soapbox. Um, what, what's kind of cool, and this has caught my attention recently as well, too. And, you know, are they good? Are they not? I don't I don't necessarily know how accurate they are. But because of this trend and to your point, Doug, this trust issue, you're seeing companies now that are filling the gap and you have home test kits. There are, for example, now home test kits for gluten where you can stick your sample of food in there and see if it, what that can, what that manufacturer is saying is really true. Yeah. Um, so these little lateral flow strips that we all became familiar with when we were <laughs> doing self-administered COVID tests, they are handy. Uh, they, they are sort of easy to use, but I kind of struggle with how do you present a sample that's a solid food to a lateral flow test strip? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, I'll just, and I'm biased. I work for testing labs. So, you know, keep that in mind too. But, you know, it's possible for you, Brian, to do uh, brain surgery on yourself. But is the outcome really going to be what you expect than if you went to a neurosurgery center? Yeah, exactly. Um, that, that's a great uh, one to end on there to get everybody thinking about that. So we're almost out of time here, Doug, unfortunately great topic here today. Any, any thoughts you would like to leave with people here for the end of the chat? Well, uh, all I can tell you is my year started out doing all kinds of uh, out of control pathogen uh, scenarios in food manufacturers. So the first two thirds of the, of the year, I was on the road basically every week doing troubleshooting. The last third of the year, for whatever reason, um, things have cleaned up. Hmm. So um, I guess I will just use this as, as a positive um, observation that maybe at least under our client base, um, 
uh, all of the, the drama has been washed out for this year. And I hope that carries over to next year for uh, everyone on the call as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a fantastic resolution for 2024, right? Let's continue to protect the food supply for sure. So with that, I wanted to put in here a couple of links, guys. So Locals is the group where I share food safety information like we're talking about here today. And I'll send out emails you know, two or three times a week on things that catch my eye. And of course, the other one is the new food safety chat database of which uh, this conversation and supporting material with Doug and all of the other people, right? Over 150 chats now are available in that database for access at a time that may be more convenient for you or listening to you in your car because an hour a week is a big investment of time. And, and we really appreciate you coming here and joining us for that. Um, so with that, we'll bring our chat to a close here for this week. Uh, always a fantastic conversation with Doug is with us. So thank you, sir. Always appreciate your patronage and your support here. And I know that everybody on the chat does as well. So everybody, we appreciate what you do as well too. So thank you for all that you do for food safety. So another one's in the books. We'll move on and we'll do the same thing next week. And we will join you here next week at the same time, Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Eastern for the next food safety chat where we live stream on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. So enjoy your weekend. Have a great time. And we will see you back here next week. Friday. So Dr. Marshall, thank you very much, sir. And we'll see everybody next week.